Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Today, we are honored to be speaking with Municipality of Central Elgin Councillor Morgan Halpin. A vibrant community located in southwestern Ontario on the picturesque shores of Lake Erie, Central Elgin's community is made up of several unique neighborhoods, each offering its unique charm and attractions. Whether you're an adventure seeker looking to golf, hike, or enjoy a peaceful evening stroll along the beach, or a foodie interested in fine dining and local vineyards, Central Elgin has something for everyone. So stay tuned and we'll be right back after a quick message with cross-border interviews featuring Councillor Morgan Halpin. Are you passionate about local governance and municipal issues? Do you believe in the power of community-driven conversations? Then join us at the Cross Border Network, where we bring together voices from across Canada to shine a spotlight on the challenges and the triumphs of our municipalities. But we need your support to keep the conversation going. Visit crossborderinterviews.ca today to show your support by backing the show monthly or making a one-time annual donation. Your contribution will help us grow and expand our reach, bringing important stories to even more listeners across the nation. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can amplify the voices of local communities. Together, we can shape a brighter future for all. Cross Border Network, where local matters and your support counts. Visit us today at crossborderinterviews.ca. Councillor, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start by getting to know the person behind the persona of a councillor position for a second. I'm going to start by asking the same question I've asked every single person who's ever come on this show, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Morgan? Uh, I don't think it was as grandiose as that. Um, for me, when my husband and I bought property and were the owners of it for the first time in our municipality, I started to realize that I had a lot of questions about things that you don't really realize you have questions about, whether that's your garbage services or your zoning or whatever it is. And I realized that nobody really thinks about municipal until they don't know what's working or what's allowed. And you don't always know who to talk to. And I was very lucky because my family has been living in the same municipality for a very, very long time. And if I didn't know who to talk to, my grand would say like, I'll talk to the mayor at church, this is fine. Um, but I started to realize that if your grand's not going to talk to the mayor for you, you don't know who to talk to and we need to be more accessible. So I guess I ran because I wanted to be an accessible counselor. Had you considered ever getting involved in politics prior to 2022? Because from, from the records <laughs> I can find, that's the first election you ran in, correct? Yep. That's right. Uh, no, I had not thought about it before. It. uh, it wasn't really on my radar until as I started to learn things, I started to realize that, yeah, that, that it was hard to find people that you could easily connect with. You couldn't just shoot a Facebook message to a counselor or you couldn't always find a phone number. And um, I started to realize too, as I looked for those things, that a lot of people didn't have them because say, I mean, a lot of the people on my council, at least last term, were quite a lot older than I am. And I realized that there's not much diversity of faces in counselors. And I thought, you know, maybe we need some of those young mums on there that understand how hard it is to get to a meeting at certain times of day. And maybe we just need more of those things. Now, you talked about the approach of the, the, the sort of the approach that people have to municipal politics a little a few minutes ago. And you mm -hmm. talked about how there's there's kind of an apathy when they're come when it comes to municipal politics. And I say that with respect to everyone who comes on this show, because I know <laughs> I'm, I'm the one weird person who likes to talk about municipal politics. But well, my guests do, too, I'm assuming, because that's why they get involved in municipal politics. Do you still see that apathy in Central Elgin? Do you still see people who just say, as long as my garbage is picked up and my water's turned on, I'm comfortable with what goes on. I'd rather deal with what's going on provincially or federally. Do people have an interest in what's going on in your community, do you believe? Uh, I would say it splits a little. Uh, you do get a lot of people that say, you know what, if I pay my taxes and those taxes go in and the services are provided and everything is running on, you know, the trains are on time, as they say, then they don't worry about it. They Some of them don't even know exactly who does what levels, right? They may not know 
who's taking, you know, I get funny calls sometimes. People say, I don't like whatever with my hydro bill. And I say, well, funny thing, we don't do your hydro bill. Like really some people fully don't know what we do and don't do, or they don't know what's upper tier and lower tier. And as long as things are working, they really are okay with that. Um, I would say in Central Elgin, we do have as well, quite a good group of people in our community that really are invested in it and following along and, you know, reading the agenda and things. And that's partly because we do have people that feel that our water rates are too high and things, and they're looking to try and understand more. And I mean, we've got some big things going on like the Volkswagen situation and so forth. So you get some people that are paying closer attention because everything's running smoothly, but they don't know where it's going to be running next, you know? Okay. You broached the subject and it's a subject that is near and dear to my heart. And if you've listened oh, to the sure. show, you know that I love talking about the jurisdictional roles that the municipality plays. You just mentioned it, that people will come to you on a range of issues, whether it be hydro, education, <laughs> healthcare. I can imagine, yep. just I can just imagine what you hear on a regular basis. How do you tell people that it's not your responsibility without telling them that it's not your responsibility? Because you are the most accessible to them. You are the one that when you make a motion, when you go to the grocery store, more likely than not, they will know yep. who you are rather than their MPP or their MP. How often do you just have to say, you know what, I'm going to have to look into this because you don't want to just pass the buck to another level of government because they've come to you because like your grandmother, I'm going to go talk to the mayor at church. I'm going to go talk to the yep. counselor at the grocery <laughs> store. So how how do you deal with issues that are not in your jurisdictional purview without telling people it's not in your uh, purview to deal with that issue? Um, so that's really funny that you say it that way. I've actually joked to a few of my friends that I've learned that now I have to wear mascara to the grocery store because like, you actually have people stop you and talk to you. <laughs> so that's terrible. Um, it's but, terrible, uh, but it's funny at the same time because funny, you, were, funny, you you get elected. You, you are a counselor 24-7 now. You're a you... counselor wherever you are. Um, but I think for me, I look at it like our goal is to represent the people to the cogs of the machinery, but it's also to represent the cogs of the machinery back to the people. So sometimes they come to you and they really don't know how the thing works or where they're supposed to be headed. And that's where you need to say, okay, so actually that's upper tier but I know who in our upper tier does that. Let me help you get in touch, right? Like, let me facilitate that and make sure you are at the right place with it. And that for me is part of being accessible. Has it been easy to be accessible in this digital age that we live in with social media? Um, we, I often find even um, in myself, uh, the accessibility is to people who want to follow, who want to be engaged. How How are you accessible to the people who, and I, I, I'm not sure, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but who aren't on social media, who aren't doing the day-to-day -day grind of looking on what's going on, because you have to be accessible to the people who are in your social circles. You have to be accessible to the right. people who are coming to councils, but you also have to be accessible to the people who, as long, like you said, as long as the water's turned on and the low, our property taxes are low and the services are good, I'm comfortable because you have to be accessible to all three levels. Is it challenging yeah. in a community like yours to be accessible to everyone while understanding that not everyone, I don't want to say cares because that just doesn't seem like the right word, but doesn't really understand that they have to get up and voice their opinions mm -hmm. on certain issues. No, that is that is a really good question. And and you're right, there's so many different ways that people access when they want to and so many ways that people decide if they want to. Um, even on social media, I would say access is a double-edged sword, right? Like it's so easy <laughs> to send a message or link someone that sometimes something gets buried and I don't notice it right away because it's so easy for people to send a message that you end up with quite a lot more of them. Um, for people that aren't using that, I've tried to make it as easy to find me as possible. Um, I've set up a website, it has a contact form. I have my personal phone number listed. Uh, I try really hard to go to the events that are in my ward in my community because people do stop you at the grocery store or they stop you at the church bazaar or wherever you're at, right? So I think being present at those things helps. Um, but you're Can right. I, it I, is, I, I'm gonna ask a question here because you just talked about that. How sure. so when you get sworn into office, when you got sworn into office in 2022, you were sworn in as a municipality of Central Elgin councillor. While you right. represent a certain ward, you look mm -hmm. at every issue as a 
municipality issue, but not a ward issue. Is it hard to balance the needs of your constituents being a ward resident councillor with the issues that are going on in central Elgin as a whole? Or are they similar enough that what issues are happening in Ward 4 are similar to what are happening in Ward 2 and the issues that are presented in front of council aren't as challenging to address as a central Elgin issue rather than a ward issue? Uh, we do have pretty different wards. Uh, we have a few wards that sort of frame around St. Thomas where it's partly rural, but then there's partly this sort of glommed on urban. We've got Port Stanley, which is a ward of its own and is very village and a little bit tourist. And we've got Belmont and then my ward is quite rural. Uh, so they do all have some different needs. And I find a lot of times there's sort of an all ships rise principle to it, right? If you're supporting something in Port Stanley that's going to help Port Stanley to generate revenue, that helps for the funding for everything else that happens in Central Elgin as well, right? So sometimes you can look at it and say it's different or it's not something being offered to us, but it's still something that helps. Uh, sometimes you find yourself looking at something like a policy or a bylaw and you go like, well, that would be useful for this group, but it might be quite annoying for that one, right? And then you kind of have to try and look more and understand more how broadly it impacts how many people. Um, is it is I it hard know. to make those choices? Is it hard to make those choices? Because you, you talk about the sort of the all ship rises, which is a great term that I'm going to use and I'm going to steal it right here, right now <laughs> for those who are about to listen to this and who are going to come on the show later on and say, where'd you get this term? Right here from this episode. Um, <laughs> is it hard to balance? Because I can, I, I would, I, I hate to assume, but I can imagine that you are approached by people in your community and say, why does this ward always get this, the, the infrastructure upgrades? Why does yes. this part of the community get the, the upgrades? Because we're still paying our property taxes and we want to see our fair share of wealth sort of distributed across the, the municipality rather than just Fort Stanley or this area. Yep, that's really true. Um, we get it both directions. We get uh, why does port <laughs> all of these things and we get from port, you know, why isn't there charge for parking in Sparta? Uh, and sometimes it really does come down to the common sense elements like, you know, if people are not fighting for parking in Sparta, then we are not alleviating anything or encouraging foot traffic by the charges, right? Like there's nothing that we improve in that way. Uh, like sometimes there's a very straightforward answer sometimes it does feel a little unfair and sometimes it's population based too. It's how many people are served in this area versus that one by having or not having the service. Um, and I don't know that I could say that I have a perfect hard set way that I decided every time. It does sort of depend on how many people are impacted and what the differences are in your ability to provide the thing, right? Um, it's definitely one of the biggest hurdles in decision-making. Okay, you, uh, you broached the subject, so I want to play in the sandbox a little bit. The, okay. These the, these decisions that you make are pretty tough because people are struggling right now. And I say struggling in the sense mm. that the inflation, the the price on everything has just gone through the roof. Inflation is bad. People are struggling. Pay, well, people are going paycheck to paycheck, uh, living. Mm. And you have an impact on that. You as an elected official have an, an impact on that. How do you make those tough decisions? How do you balance the needs of the community against the needs of the people in the community? Because you want to see your community grow. You want to see investment come to your community. So that way it might offset in the future. But people are struggling here and now. How do you balance the future of the community with the people who are in the community today? Um, well, I guess I look at that and I think in many respects, the needs of the people and the needs of the community are often very closely tied. People don't always think about it that way. Sometimes people see, you know, an increase in their taxes and they feel like that's not serving their needs. But then on the other hand, when you think about how you manage your own house, you know, you want to have that savings for when there's a roof problem or a leak or whatever there is. You need to have those things. Sometimes you need to be putting into a reserve for something that's coming up in a year or two. Uh, and nobody likes it. But if it's that or suddenly there's a giant bill, you know what you would do for yourself and your own family. And you know that sometimes you invest in a thing knowing that it's going to come back and benefit your family, right? That's like your your RRSP or your kid's RESP or whatever it is. Sometimes you have to take and put away knowing that it's going to benefit. And in the same way, there are times that people don't like to see an increase in a bill. And yet, if you're 
specifically looking at it and you're taking the reports and you're taking the facts that are given to you and you know that long term it is going to be to their benefit we are here to plan for the long term so sometimes that's how we have to do that how important is it for you to listen to both sides of every issue that is presented in front of council? Uh, because you, you're going to have people who are impacted negatively. You're going to have people impacted positively on every decision. And mm. I can imagine after two years of being an elected official, you've re come to the realization, like every other municipal leader, you're not pleasing a hundred percent of the people in your community at a hundred percent of the issues. Um, I think there's a huge problem in even saying both sides of the issue. Cause often <laughs> there's not both. There's three sides or four sides. <laughs> to the angle, right? Like often it's a whole lot of sides. Um, because at first you said it and I was thinking you mean like when the staff recommendation is this and then the public wants this. And then I went, oh, do you mean when the public wants this and the public wants this? Or like which way are we going there? Um, I've never been called out on that question, but thank you so much for clarifying that. <laughs> There's more than two. There's always more than two. Um it is tough. You do have to listen to everyone. Uh I think the hardest thing sometimes is getting people to understand that listening doesn't always mean following through on what they want. Um, I kind of think of that as the mean mom principle. Like my five-year-old would love if I let her have candy every night for dinner. But I know that as her mom, my job is to sometimes make sure that she gets a vegetable in her body. And sometimes you have to look at it and say, okay, I have four different sets of voices telling me what they want on this. And the biggest group wants this. And I know they'd love that. And that would be wonderful for them. But also my job is to make sure that they do have that long-term finance situation in order, that they do get the services that they need, that everybody is safe, right? And sometimes you have to look at it and say, okay, well, I did listen, but it doesn't mean I'm going to do as asked, right? Listening and complying, I guess, are different. Is it hard to make those tough choices? Because... Mm -hmm. You have an abundance of people who are coming to you on all different sides. And I say all different sides now because it's not a two-sided issue. Mm -hmm. You, at the end of the day, are that one lone vote. You are that one lone vote on that council that has to make those tough decisions. Has it gotten mm -hmm. easier or is it still the same challenging uh, sort of process that you have to sort of reflect it internally with yourself to make that decision at the end of the day when you finally do say yay or nay to a motion? I think it's hard every time, every time you know that what you're doing is going to change someone's budgeting or change whether their kids have what they wanted at the park or change something they cared about in their neighborhood, right? Every single decision is deeply important for people at a very close to home personal level. And so there's never a time, even though you managed the hurdle to once, that you don't know that it's just as significant, but maybe for a different neighborhood or whatever it might be, but it always feels that way. Um, I want to turn to the second segment now because I'm cautious of time. And I think this is sure. going to be an engaging conversation through this part because we've already taken up 15 minutes and I <laughs> feel like we're we're going to spend about 20 minutes just on this segment alone. But sure. before I ask this first question, I'm going to preface it by saying this is a conversation between the councillor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not a policy of council. This is her opinion and her opinion alone. She has one vote on council and she only gets one vote, and she doesn't get to just move things at will. That being said, Councillor, in your opinion, what do you believe is the biggest issue or issues facing Central Elgin today as of recording this episode? Right now, as of recording this episode, we have some very major infrastructure on a number of levels that we're going to have to address. Uh, with Volkswagen coming in, we have to look to what our servicing looks like if we are going to plan for similar structures and similar opportunities for our community uh, in that area. And frankly, uh, it's a massive amount of in infrastructure for hydro and water and wastewater and all of these things to consider and undertake. Uh, we also have some water and wastewater that's going to need, that's in our capital budget right now, that's going to need replacing. And people are already concerned about the rates on our water. so there's going to be a lot of asset management in the next few years that's going to be pretty significant for us. You've talked about the VW plant that was announced, I think, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, and correct me if I'm wrong here, I think it was announced early 2023 or even right. late late 2022. It was in sort of- I think it was rumors in late 2022 and it was more concrete by the start of 2023. So- the province and the federal government basically mm -hmm. had the big ribbon cutting ceremony, which is great for the community because it will bring jobs, mm -hmm. it will bring investment. But 
you talked about something that is uh, something that we often always forget about because it's not the quote unquote sexy thing to talk about, but infrastructure, <laughs> water, roads, underground pipes, yeah. all this the things that need to happen before this investment comes. Is Central Elgin in a point where they are looking at other methods to potentially bring this infrastructure? Because you don't want to do it on the backs of the people who are in your community. You don't want to no. tell the federal government, hey, we can't we can't have this investment that you've just uh, attracted to our community because we just don't have the infrastructure. Is it a balancing act for yourself and council? And I, I know you, I'm talking to the council here, not the mayor and not the right. uh, the the area council, uh, the region the, I think it's the, uh, oh my God, I'm thinking of uh, county. There we go. Wow. <laughs> I, 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 it's been a long day. I thought you did uh, this on a regular basis. Oh, I do. It's just the, every province, every municipality has so many different second tier yeah. levels that you never know what they're yeah. called. Um, is it hard to balance what the investment that's coming with the, the realities that you're under right here and now? Because if you have to improve this infrastructure and the federal government, the provincial government don't come to the table, you have to do it on the backs of your people that are currently there. Yeah, it's a real tightrope. I mean, it's only the opportunity is only worth as much as the paper it's on until you can actually put, you know, until you can get something in the ground and do something. And if you don't have those services, then there is no business that really wants to be there and is ready to work with you. Um, and we don't want to do it on the backs of people, especially when this has already caused a lot of change for a lot of people in this neighborhood and so forth, right? There's, and our community is already struggling with other assets upcoming, like their own wastewater that they actually were using, right? Um, we are the average, still the, in the negotiation. I apologize. Does the average person understand the infrastructure deficit in your community? Are they looking, because you, you say that there's people concerned with the realities that they're facing, mm -hmm. but- I've talked to many mayors and councillors across my on this show, and whenever I ask them about the infrastructure issues, they always say uh, it's something that keeps council up at night. And I've never asked the question: Does it? Does it? Do you hear people say we really need to fix this wastewater facility treatment plant because I think it's going to be a concern for us in five years, or is it just something that they are aware of but they don't really talk to you about? They'd rather talk about potholes or things that they can actually <laughs> see and and I. They can see a wastewater treatment facility plant, but they don't understand that that thirty million dollar project is not just that little building off to the side or a big building off yeah. to the side. Do do people talk about infrastructure projects in Central Elgin because of this new VW plant that's coming? I would say they do talk about them more and more, not specifically in the context of VW, but in the context of people seeing our water rates increase and trying to understand those increases, we get more and more people saying, well, where is the study? Where is the financial plan? Like, I want to see it and understand. And so then they do start to look and see that actually you've got several years of what you anticipate working on and why that is. And there is more and more engagement on it. Um, but I think often more from the stance of how much is it going to cost in these years than truly understanding sometimes why you have to have that cost. I do think that the more people engage with it, the more conversation you get, and the more conversation there is, the more sort of whole that knowledge gets. But yes, there's some fragmenting there. <laughs> is it hard to be transparent in your position? Because you can only go as far, because you talked about transparency at the beginning of the interview, and you can only mm -hmm. go, you can only be as transparent as you can be, because at the end of the day, the residents have to take it the other step, right? They have to actually search out the information. They can approach you. They can ask for information, mm -hmm. but you can say it's on the website. You can actually print it off and deliver it to them. But unless they read it and understand it, because you're getting paid to understand it, many people yeah. might just have more questions if you are as transparent as you can be. And then at the end of the day, people are going, I still don't understand why the rates are so high, even with the mm -hmm. study that you've just given us. Yeah, it is tough. Um, I have a few times ended up sitting down over a coffee with someone with the paper and <laughs> looking at it. But obviously, when you're only getting a part time counselor's wage, you can really only do so much of that. Um, I have a website. And sometimes when I'm getting a lot of questions about something, I'll do sort of a blog post that covers some of the high level stuff and tries to give some broad answers to things I'm hearing a lot of so that you know, you can catch more people that way. But as you said before, not everyone is a really heavy online media user, right? So you do still miss people that way. Um, I do try my best to make sure that I'm finding methods like that to reach more people. 
But uh, yeah, at a certain level, they do have to do some research too. And that can be tough because it's dense. There's so much that goes on in a municipality. If I go to Central Elgin tomorrow, you've talked about infrastructure, mm -hmm. which is a very macro issue, very big issue mm -hmm. that a lot of people deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. But residents have very micro issues as well. They have that pothole yep. that's in front of their house. They have a service level mm -hmm. that they want upgrade. You talked about it earlier. Why is this community, why does this community not have paid parking? Well, my community has paid parking. How do you balance that? Because at the end of the day, you know you only have a certain amount of money that you can spend every day as a municipality. You can't run deficits, unlike the provincial and federal government. Is it right. hard to balance the issues that community members have when you have such a massive macro issue like infrastructure that is coming down the pipeline that is going to take up much of the budget because infrastructure projects are not cheap today and you still have to try and figure out how do you make people feel like their tax dollars are being spent on them while being spent on them through infrastructure projects as well that is hard um and it can be hard even in the micro issues honestly um we did a budget survey in december and when we came back and looked at it we had quite a lot of people saying i would like you to try and either not increase the taxes or keep it as low as you possibly can and yet we had those same people saying, but also we want you to add compost service. And also we want more programming for our kids. And, and you look at it and you go, well, I want to give you those things too, but I don't know how I'm going to do that on a zero, right? Like that's, there's only so much I can do for you there. And then when it's stuff they don't see, like, yeah, like sewer lines, that's that much more complicated. Um, and I'm hoping that we can seek other sources for some things. Like we are still in negotiations about Volkswagen and what our, potential losses that should be compensated might look like and so forth. I'm hoping that we can find ways to bring it from other places for them. Uh, but it's very hard even to have some of those conversations. Uh, the last time that Joe Preston, the mayor in St. Thomas, came and spoke to my council about Volkswagen, he said, well, we get the benefit of Volkswagen, but you will have all of these new residential folk coming in, and that's going to be great for your tax revenue. And at the time, I said to him, well, but a municipality spends a lot less to service industrial land and tends to generate a lot more tax from it. Whereas you spend a lot more taking care of people and neighborhoods and you get less tax from it. So really, how is that going to work for us? And he never did answer that question, right? So sometimes figuring out where that money is going to come from and how you're going to meet those needs, it is complicated. And we are going to have to see how some of those bal balancing issues develop as we go with it. I would hate to ask, but I'm going to ask the political question here. But when, okay. you he when you hear mayors like that, and as a counselor, when you hear a mayor come into your community <laughs> and say something like that, who doesn't really give you an answer, and maybe uh, Mayor Preston is a good guy. I've never met him. Uh, I haven't reached out uh, to his office to have him on the show. Maybe I will after this conversation. You probably should. He's lovely I to talk to. <laughs> there you go. How do you... <sighs> Your, the investment that you will be getting from this VW plant will not just uh, have impacts on your community, it will have impacts on the surrounding communities, but yes. you will be carrying the biggest price tag for the infrastructure project. St. Thomas is not mm -hmm. going to be asked, is not going to be giving you a big check over tomorrow and saying, here, we're going to cut a deal with you and we're going to pay for some of the infrastructure project upgrades because we think it's only reasonable. They might. Because we feel terrible. Exactly. Yep. They might. <laughs> it, this project is a massive project for your community. It is mm -hmm. going to have ramifications. It's going to bring investment to your community like there's no other. Is it challenging when other people get the benefits of your rewards a little bit? <laughs> it's certainly frustrating when you see other communities flourishing, when you know that you have needs in your own and you know you'd like to be addressing them. Uh -huh. um, but you don't get to pick, right? Nobody promises that everything's going to be fair or easy every time and you have to kind of roll with what you get. Um, I want to ask the flips question to the beginning of the segment. I want to ask, what sure. does Central Elgin get right? 
what is the thing that when you go to Roma, when you go to AMO conferences, when you talk to other municipal leaders and you boast about your community internally, like administration wise, mm -hmm. government wise, policy wise, what's the thing that you are proud of when it comes to the government of Central Elgin? I get a lot of great feedback about the way that we manage our tourism situation in Port Stanley, the way that we are combing our beach, providing public washrooms so that it's not a burden on our restaurants and things. Um, I get a lot of good feedback from outside about how we do those things that draw people in for our business areas. Now, granted, from within the community, I get the why is the parking a paid for thing and why is it so congested and things, right? It's not perfect to everyone in every way, but from those other people working on those elements of municipal life, uh, people often do seem to feel that we do a very good job of that. So it's a perfect segue into my tourism questions now, because okay. it seems like you've talked about tourism a few <laughs> times already. So let's talk about tourism sure. a little bit here. Um, as someone who's about to come to your community later on this summer, I've made a promise oh. that if you come on this show, I come to your community and I'm doing a massive swing through Southwestern Ontario. So I will be coming to Central Elgin to visit you and visit your great community of Central Elgin. What are the tourist destinations that people should come and see when they're in your community? And I say your community, you don't just have to stick to your ward. You can do the entire municipality mm -hmm. if you want. What are some of the hidden gems, the tourist destinations that you need to get off the beaten path and go see if you were directing a tourist coming to your community? In my ward, I really like uh, Wildflowers Farm. It, they raise bees and hold events and things, but on their Friday nights, they do a farmer's market. And I love that it's a Friday night market because most of them are Saturdays and Sundays. So you get a lot of the same really good vendors sort of dispersed out to different locations and things, but there's not many that are doing the evening. So you go out there Friday night and they are serving cocktails and they've got live music and they've got, you know, all of these lovely different uh, farms and crafters and things out there. Um, that's one that I really like to get out to and that I don't see anything quite like it. Um, in Port Stanley, we're going to have lots of stuff going on this year. It's our 200th anniversary. So uh, they have a whole website with events they're going to have going on all summer. And of course, the beach, even if there was not a major anniversary, is one of our biggest draws. <laughs> is it really? Is it one of the, is it like, a, like, is it on the same scale of Wasaga Beach a little bit? You know what? I've never actually tried to compare it. I don't know what the numbers are for people coming in, <laughs> but our parking lots are always full and the businesses <laughs> seem to be doing beautifully. Uh, people enjoy it. We had last year, there was a business that was doing uh, chair rentals and umbrellas and all these lovely beach setups. Um, it's very welcomed. It's very well maintained. Uh, the buildings are lovely. We've got volleyball nets in again now, so that's good. Uh, or volleyball posts, I should say. I think most like, of our players are bringing nets. But like, uh, like yeah, right, like right now, you have volleyball nets. Like we're recording this in March, and I'm thinking unless sorry, like, no, I was correcting to posts. We have the posts in. I think our volleyball players are mostly bringing their nets. But um, but yeah, it's very actively used all year round. I just went to a charity golf tournament out on the beach uh, about a month ago. <laughs> Um, we were hitting tennis balls around the beach. It was excellent. So even in the winter, it is getting used. Um, and we have people, I'm sometimes quite surprised at the distances people are coming from to visit it when they talk to me. So yeah, I would say that is still not a hidden gem, not like wildflowers, but certainly it is our biggest draw and the thing you should be checking for. Where do you go? After a stressful day of council meetings, because I can imagine there's days that you get I, I, would, I don't want to say bogged mm -hmm. down, but you I'm assuming, like most people, you don't want to be sitting in a council meeting for 10 hours deliberating issues, but you do because that's what you signed up for. But yep. after those days, when you need to decompress and go and just let it all go and realize that tomorrow morning you're going to have to wake up and do the exact same thing over again. Is there a like special spot that you go into Central Elgin that you can just decompress a little bit and refocus yourself for tomorrow morning? And are you going to be, or are you going to be like every other municipal politician I'd speak to and say, it's my house. I love just going <laughs> home and not doing anything. Well, I was going to say, if it's 11 at night and a hard meeting, I'm probably having a drink is what I'm doing. <laughs> but uh, honestly, um, I am a bit of a homebody. I'm usually after a meeting, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to go home and read a book, watch something, try to not think about my council meeting for a few minutes. Cause I know I'm going to get those calls the next day. 
um, after my conservation authority meetings. I sometimes bring my kids with me to the conservation authority meetings and they'll do some arts and crafts in the kitchen while we do our board meeting. And then we go out and swim in the lake and go on the climber and walk and all of those good things because spring water is very lovely. Uh, but yeah, usually our council runs quite late and I'm just relieved to get home if it was a rough one. What makes Central Elgin such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Um, for me, I think what I really appreciate and I think that we have that's special is that we are still in many respects very rural. Um, I lived in town in St. Thomas with my husband before we bought our place out on Roberts and moving out there and having people pull up to introduce themselves if they didn't already know you or pull up and say, oh, hey, it's so cool that we're on the same line now because our families, you know, like my grand and your grand already know each other and all of those like people taking that time and caring for each other and watching each other's kids and helping them get them on the bus and checking on each other's animals and, you know, people actually taking an interest in each other and caring about what's going on and how they can help each other and support each other. I think sometimes when a community gets too big, you start to lose sight of that because you figure someone else is taking care of them. And when it's small and a little more spread out, you do take that time. Now, usually that is the question I end the show on, but I want to end <laughs> on a different part because I think this okay. is important. Now, you've mm -hmm. been elected now for a year and a bit. I say year and a mm -hmm. bit because you're coming up to two years in October, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. October is the election in Ontario. Um, yep. Is it what you've expected? Looking back when you first decided to run for municipal politics to where you are today, is it what you expected the job was going to be? Because we have listeners from across Canada, and there are people who are about to put their names on a ballot in Nova Scotia, in Saskatchewan, in Northwest Territories, in the Yukon, who are thinking, should I put my name on that ballot? For you, has it been what you expected, being someone who moves into a community, who wanted to be more transparent, who wanted to get more involved and put their name on the ballot and you were the successful candidate? Was it what you expected? And are you looking back on the last two years and go, yep, yeah, this is a, this is what I thought I would be doing two years later? I, uh, I don't think I was terribly surprised. I'm a bit of a planner. Before I put my name on the ballot, I got in touch with the, the, the then Ward 2 counselor and I sat down and said, like, talk to me about the time commitments, talk to me about the committees, talk to me about the things. I don't think I was terribly blindsided. Uh, I do think I was surprised at how stop and start it sometimes feels like you get into the summer and every single board says, well, we're going to do summer vacation. We're only meeting half as often or we're only whatever. And then you get to certain times like now and you've got your budget committee and your strat planning and your everything going at the same time. And you feel like you can hardly get into work some days because you're trying to go to meetings. And I don't think I realized how it would feel like there were such slow times and such busy times. Um, I don't think I realized how much some people would be like contacting you because they're on top of everything. They know the issue, they know what they need out of it and they've got the details and they're sort of looking to take steps and how much you would sometimes be like coaching and teaching. Uh, so I guess I would say both on the social level and the time level, I didn't know what the highs and lows were gonna be. Um, but I don't think I was really surprised by most of it. What do you wish you would have known prior to getting mm -hmm. elected because um, you, you talk about the the stops and starts, the, the people who know mm -hmm. all the information you don't, but is there one thing you wish you, you, you say to yourself, I wish I would have known this beforehand because I think it would have set me up to be a better municipal leader today than it was when I was first started. I think the one thing, this is kind of vague, it's gonna sound washy. I don't know if I can really pin this down for any one person. I think the thing I wish I had really known and appreciated was how much you have to already know what your personal mandate and philosophy is going in because everyone else is going to try to give one to you, right? Like everyone that's been on a council, everyone that has a bee in their bonnet issue, everyone's going to come to you and say, here's how to do it right. And you have to really have a pretty thorough idea about how your decision making works and what your principles for it are going to be because everyone has one and everyone's happy to tell you what it is. <laughs> so yeah, that's something that I think whether yours ends up the same as mine or not, you really do need to make sure you know what it is. Is it hard to stick to that principle? Because you do have so many different 
factors mm-hmm. pulling you in different ways. But at the end of the day, you have to lay your head down on that pillow and be happy with the way that things went that day. Or if you asked enough questions, you voted in the way that you mm-hmm. you truly believed in. Is it hard to stick to your principles when you see the, the challenges that municipalities have and you kind of have to sort of be pulled in 12 different directions, but still be true to who you are? It's hard to know you're disappointing people. <laughs> I'll say that. It is hard when you know that you're sticking to those principles and someone's not happy with it somewhere, whether that's someone else at the table with you voting or someone who really wanted you to make the other decision that's been calling you about it. It's always hard to know that sticking to that principle is somewhere sad for someone or not, maybe annoying for them or maybe frustrating. There's always someone who doesn't like what you stuck with and that is hard. I don't find sticking with the decision hard, but I do find it hard knowing that I wish I could make everyone happy, you know? What advice would you give to the next crop of counselors? Um, There are people who are looking at you and saying, I could do what Morgan does. Maybe I should go and put my name on the ballot in the next Ontario election or an election outside of Ontario. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give to a prospective counselor? Because you talk about the principles that you have to hold true to yourself. But is there something that you would recommend that they do today to get them prepared to so that way when they do put their name on that ballot, they're not sort of playing catch up in the end at the end of the day? Yeah. I would say if you're looking going like I can do what Morgan does, you can. We are all lay people. Every one of us at the table is a lay person who has stepped up and taken that job. Uh, they will provide you training. They are going to make sure you understand the role. Uh, there's a counselor's guide. You can look up the Ontario counselor's guide, and it's like a Cole's notes of what it is to be on council and what roughly is in the act and all of those things, start looking at that stuff. Call your counselor and find out what they're doing in a day and how many committees they're on and things, right? Like it's there and available to you. And if you want to get an idea of if you can manage the time and stuff, then yeah, do a little bit of homework and be ready for it. And we are all lay people. It's not something that you can or can't because you do or don't know now, right? Are you happy that you are here right now making the tough decisions? Because we've chatted, we've chatted about some very big issues over the last half, mm-hmm. of almost 40 minutes now. Looking back, uh, I know you say it was what you it was you expected because you were your planner and you asked these tough questions, but uh, has it weighed on you? Has it weighed on your ability to look at your community and not look at the issues anymore and say, okay, I thought my community was so simple in some sense, but now being at that council table, making these tough choices, there's a lot of issues that are facing our community and I'm happy that I'm here and I get to be a part of making those tough choices to better our community for not only my kids' generation, but their kids' generation after that. I don't think it's been a burden to me enjoying my community at all. Um, If anything, I would say, I've met more people and I appreciate more things. I go down the road and I see different work being done and I go, I know why that matters and I know who it's helping. Um, This last week I went to Toronto with my kids for a March break vacation and we were on the subway, which is terrifying. My kids had never been on an escalator before. So like this was a big thing, but um, we went on the subway and we got off at the museum station and I was looking around going like, imagine having enough tourism income and infrastructure to make decisions like, should we make these pillars look like hieroglyphs because it will be joyful and people will want to see it, right? Like, like you start to look at it and think about that. Like who decided how that was gonna happen and <laughs> how did that get designed and where in the budget did it come from, right? And if anything, I think it makes me appreciate more as I go. Counselor, this has been an honor. <laughs> I I I would I would make a joke about Toronto and that, some of the decisions they make, but oh, I'm, I not know, going, I know. I'm not going to. You can. I'm not going to. I'm going to say thank you so much for doing this. This has been a wonderful experience, and uh, it doesn't even seem like 40 minutes have passed, but here we are, 40 minutes yep. later, and we're chatting. Um, thank you so much for sitting down, taking time out of your busy schedule to do this. Uh, I'm looking forward to visiting uh, the municipality later on this summer. Hopefully you'll have time for a coffee. I'd love to see that the beach up close and personal. Um, but thank you so much for serving your community. I don't think you <laughs> as municipal leaders hear that enough, but it's high time that you do. So thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure.
Now, if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth conversations here on the cross-border interviews and our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. We are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well-informed and engaged. Your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to enjoy. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.